So welcome. Oh yes. So take your time to come on to your seat slowly. We don't want to push it too late, so we have time later to have some conversations as well, not just presentations. Um, so don't be shy, come on, there are seats over here. Um, now it's still a good time to change your position in the room. Later it might become awkward. Great. Or, or secure one of the bar stools, that's also fun. You cannot hear us at all. Okay, so also, small hint for the speakers, you have to speak up and hold it very, very close to me so that people can hear you. And if you cannot hear me or any of the speakers at some point, just raise your hands and wave in the back and maybe people will understand and speak up a little bit. Great, so hello and welcome to Pocasito Postcard Cities of Tomorrow from circular economy to circular society here in Baltimore. I'm Max Grunig with the Ecologic Institute. I'm very happy to be here tonight with you. I'm more happy even that all of you made your way out here at, on this Tuesday evening. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you'll enjoy this evening. We have a long list of speakers, but also time for discussion here. So it's supposed to be interactive. Next to me is my colleague Brandon O'Donnell, also with the Ecologic Institute, and uh, kind of the brainchild behind the Pocasito program. Uh, he'll tell you a lot more about this later. Do you want to say something now, right away? No, I can, I'll talk a little more when we have the, the group dialogue, but uh, I'm very excited about the speakers we have tonight. Great evening. Good, good. I'm optimistic too. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to say we start now with a few opening remarks and I wanted to ask up first uh, Rachel Singers. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. I should have, should have given a little bit more warning. So she's from the Rotterdam, uh, Baltimore Rotterdam Sister Cities Committee and it's a volunteer uh, position, so it's actually all the help, all the time she puts in for helping us co-hosting this event here tonight. It's all volunteer work, so really appreciate it. She put in a lot of effort to also get people here and uh, to make this happen tonight. So thank you very much, Rachel. called Baltimore Sister Cities, and it's a nonprofit that manages the relationships with about eight cities around the world. There are brochures back there if you're interested. It's all volunteer run. It's all labor of love, but it is very exciting you know, to volunteer for this. You get to meet people from around the world and make international collaborations happen on all kinds of subject matter, you know, whether it be sustainability, education, urban planning, medicine, you name it. Um, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Baltimore Rotterdam relationship. It started in 1985. And the reason why Rotterdam chose Baltimore is like Baltimore, it is a port city where the port operations keep moving further out away from the city center. So you're left with these old harbor fronts and you don't know what to do with them. And um, back then, in the mid-1980s, Baltimore had redeveloped and created an harbor place, um, redeveloped its downtown waterfront as a tourist destination, and back then that was pretty revolutionary. So Rotterdam was interested in learning from that and had um, taken some cues from Baltimore in its own waterfront development. Um, so another thing I want to mention is that uh, we partner with some other partners in the area. So we partner often with the Netherlands Embassy. Uh, there was going to be a speaker from the Netherlands Embassy here tonight, um, but unfortunately he's sick. So I'm sorry, Young Palin, we miss you. Um, but thank you for offering to speak 
Um, we also partner with an organization called the Netherlands America Chamber of Commerce, Washington Metro, uh, which is a long string of words, but they uh, promote business development between the Washington and Maryland region and the Netherlands, um, and they are interested in promoting, you know, circular economy, business development, business exchanges. Um, and I wanted to talk, since Yellow Penguin's not here tonight, talk a little bit about the Netherlands and the circular economy. So the Netherlands has created some ambitious goals. It wants to reduce the use of primary raw materials by 50% by 2030. And by that, we mean materials like minerals, fossil fuels, and metals. And it wants to make the entire, uh, entire country 100% circular, all the economy, the entire country, 100% circular by 2050. And then Rotterdam, the city of Rotterdam, has set an even higher bar for itself. It wants to be 100% circular by 2030, which is only about 10 years from now. Um, Amsterdam has also set um, um, big goals. So both Rotterdam and Amsterdam are pioneers now in moving towards a circular economy, which means a different way of doing business where you minimize the waste that you generate. And the waste that you generate gets made into new products. Um, and there are a lot of startups in both of those cities that are working on circular economy initiatives and really being pioneers. And both cities have circular economy incubators. Um, Rotterdam is a new city, and Amsterdam has the Kovel. We have somebody here from the, the Kovel, so if you're interested in Sandra McHugh over there from Symbolic. Um, our committee has been promoting knowledge exchanges between the Maryland and Netherlands on circular economy, sustainable waste development, and also topics related to climate change, like flood resiliency. I wanted to let you know about a couple of things coming up. So first of all, in fall 2017, there was a conference here, the International Solid Waste Association Conference here in Baltimore. It's held every year, and um, they talk about sustainable waste development, waste management. Rotterdam sent a delegation here to Baltimore in 2017 to promote the circular economy. Now, next year in the fall, late September, there will be, um, this conference will be held in Rotterdam. So we're going to see if we can get Maryland to send some people to this conference in Rotterdam. There's some businesses that are interested. We want to get some more businesses interested, but we would also like maybe community activists to go who is in, involved in solid waste uh, issues here. Uh, or somebody from Baltimore City, maybe Office of Sustainability, to go. So that's late September uh, next year, and, and we would support that and help you with that. Uh, there will also be a major international climate adaptation summit in Rotterdam around that time as well. So you can do a two for one. On November 6th at the Enoch Pratt Library at 1030, there will be a free performance for kids by Kathy DiStefano about trash and recycling. Kathy DiStefano lives in Rotterdam, born in the U.S. She's sitting all the way in the back there. She, this is her first day in Baltimore. She visits about twice a year. Um, and she's working with DPW on some educational materials um, for teachers about trash and recycling and doing that performance and doing some other things. There's a flyer back there that lists some of the things that she's doing. And on November 16th, there is a meeting of the Baltimore Zero Waste Communities Task Force meeting at the Brooklyn Library, and there's a flyer about it there and, and there, if you're interested in that. I probably went over time, but thank you for your <laughs> thank you. attention. Thank you, Rachel. And all of this very important information, and it's very good that you seize the opportunity to uh, pitch these occasions here, these opportunities. I wish I had such a long list of events to announce, but I do have some speakers to announce I would like to ask. Eva Funjes Olin from the Embassy of Sweden uh, up here to the front of the audience. She's uh, in charge of economics and trade at the embassy and is an advisor for environment and climate. And in that regard, it's a perfect fit for the circular economy because it combines everything. It combines economy, it combines uh, environmental protection and climate action all in one big Task, but Sweden is certainly also a leader in that field, and so welcome and thank you for joining us here tonight. Thank you for, for having me. Um, thank you, Max, for inviting us. Uh, and the reason you did is that we have two really good experts from Sweden, Matilda Rosa, who you will hear about later on this evening. So 
But Max asked me to touch base a little bit on uh, what Sweden do when it comes to sustainability. Uh, the embassy of Sweden, as you know, goes like all the, all the other embassies are down in Washington. We engage very actively, I would say, uh, on environmental issues with, uh, with your current administration. We try. It's a little bit more challenging these days than a few years ago. Uh, we try to activate um, the Congress, and we understand that we happy that there's a little bit more debate on climate change and those issues down in Washington. But we also have started to engage better on, with cities and states uh, uh, due to this current administration on environment issues. But as you know, Sweden is known for uh, being a sustainable country and sustainability is important to us. <coughs> but it wasn't, uh, hasn't always been the case. So 50, this is a story that often says, uh, tell Americans, uh, some 50 years ago, uh, Sweden was in a much different place. Uh, we were very dependent on foreign oil. Uh, we had a lot of environmental damage. But we realized uh, that we were losing our limited natural resources. Uh, so we made some tough decisions. We uh, created the first ever environmental protection agency in the world in 1969. Uh, we were the host for UN's first ever environment conference in Stockholm in 1972. And uh, at the end of the, the public debate uh, when it comes to environment started, I would say, in the late 70s, beginning of the 80s. We had a nuclear energy referendum in 1980 after the accident here in the US in 1979. That was kind of a wake-up call for Sweden. Um, and uh, Sweden decided to turn around and become a much more environmentally friendly country uh, by then. And that's also when we established our Green Party. And today, actually, the Green Party and the Social Democrats uh, are holding our government um, and are putting uh, high ambitions on, on, on Sweden as a country. We try to lead by example uh, when it comes to environmental issues. We find um, multilateralism very important. We want to, of course, we would like to see U.S. still in the Paris Agreement. We know that maybe next week, um, U.S. will formally announce that we will withdraw. So that's uh, next week you are first available to do so. And of course, that's sad to us if you decide to do that. But Sweden, we will stay in. We will lead by example. And I'm going to uh, tell you some things we've done to, to turn things around. Uh, Sweden is also, even if it's known for sustainability, we're also known for taxes. Uh, so taxes is one of our uh, big policy instruments. Um, so we have shifted the tax burden in favor of green taxes, uh, with higher taxes on non-eco-friendly consumption, primarily on energy and carbon. Uh, we were one of the first countries in the world with a carbon tax. Uh, we came with one already in 1991. Um, here you're starting to have a debate on the carbon tax, and we welcome that, because we think the pricing on carbon would really uh, make us maybe be able to transition better to a more climate-friendly environment. We have a carbon tax um, of 110 US dollars or so per ton. I think in the US you're talking about maybe 25, or proposal that's not in Congress, maybe talking about 25 or so forth. So the carbon tax, I wanted to mention that because that is, has been a very important tool for Sweden because that's how we have. And that came, I guess, because of the dependence on foreign oil. Um, because with the carbon tax, we've had a major impact on finding energy efficient solutions. And we have uh, started to increase the use of bioenergy. And uh, the carbon tax has had, especially has had main impact on heating. Uh, most, if not all cities today, use district heating. Um, our industry is today more energy efficient and competitive. And tax revenues from our carbon tax is a much welcome to strengthen our public finance so we can have lower tax on labor and um, we can achieve certain social goals that we set up with the carbon tax. Uh, we have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 26% since 1990. At the same time, we have grown our economy by 71%. And we broke this curve uh, already in the 90s. Nordic countries. 
I'm just going to end with our big, uh, big target that our current government has said. Is she said that Sweden aims to be the first fossil-free welfare nation in the world, and in the long term, that our energy system will be based on 100% renewable energy. Now we're close already. We we have about 60% renewable energy in our energy system today. A lot of this work, even though compared to the US, US federal policies or national policies are are very clear in Sweden. We have a climate act and so forth that you do not have here, um, uh, strong at least. Um, but a lot of the work is done by cities, uh, so they are driving. Uh, the work to become more sustainable. And one of the success stories, I guess, that Sweden's really good about is waste management that you will talk about uh, uh, later on. We often say this because we brag about this in the US, uh, that only 1% uh, goes to landfills in, the, in, in Sweden. I think maybe the number is 50% in the US as an average of waste goes to landfills. Only 1% goes to landfills in Sweden. Uh, so we like to brag about this, and we, um, at the embassy this year, we have focused, we have a big, I guess the biggest embassy in the world from Sweden, I guess, is in Washington, D.C., and we have a big um, house there called House of Sweden, I don't know if you've ever been down there, but I would say that would be our flagship embassy in the world. And we have a big public diplomacy program, and we focus on different themes throughout the years. This year we've been focusing on smart societies, we've done a lot of work on smart cities. Next year we're going to focus on mobility and transportation sector. But, as part of this work, we host discussions so forth in Washington, but we also would like people to come to Sweden. I just want to mention to you, I have a fly in the back, we would love to have somebody from Baltimore, come to Sweden in uh, February on a waste inspiration tour in southern Sweden in Helsingborg and Stockholm. So I welcome you to, um, to stay in touch with me, you keep reach out to me and I'll be happy to, to connect. Thank you very much. And uh, just want to say it's of course a kind that it's in southern Sweden and not in northern Sweden in February because uh, I've been to Kiruna in, in March and it's still a little bit uh, cold but of course there's, at least there's light so the days are getting longer so it's actually it's an interesting time of the year to be in. Um, and now you've heard a little bit on the Netherlands and Sweden and kind of how great these are and that leads me to say again how we are grateful for the support from the European Union and of course both the Netherlands and Sweden are members of the European Union so they're kind of competing but they're also partnering and they're more partnering than competing but it's good to have competition in the race for sustainability I'm all for that uh, as long as we're all trying to be first on being good and green so just want to say we'll have a few input statements they'll be brief they'll be not very lengthy no worries and then we have time for discussion so um, just wanted to encourage you to already collect uh, questions and ideas what you want to see also if you're still hungry there's still food in the back and also something to drink and with that I want to ask also Stenmark up here also works for the Swedish Environmental Research Institute IBL and has uh, basically two decades of experience. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Just, 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 no, 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 you started very young um, in, in the circular economy and on resource management. So you're a total expert, let's put it that way. I won't say numbers anymore. You can say numbers, I'll pull up some slides. And um, thank you. Thank you so much. Actually, IBL was founded two years before the Swedish EPA, so I'm very proud of that. Uh, we're sort of an old organization. And we are non-governmental. Thank you. Uh, non-governmental, non-profit, and independent. We do all kinds of environmental projects, but I do waste and resources and materials and sustainable consumption, and which you could all labor on the circular economy. And I just want to show, I won't go on now to talk about IVL, but I just want to show you this bottom line here that we have in our vision that we should make our, make our economy go from a linear one to a circular one. And uh, you'll be hearing more of our 
European speakers here and also some other interesting speakers. Uh, but um, I would a little bit set the scene on circular economy to explain to you a little bit what the concept is about, perhaps, and uh, yeah, and why it's important. So this is a little bit what we have today, right? We buy a lot of stuff. We think it makes us happy, but uh, and it keeps our economy going. And uh, some of you might have seen this quote. It's by this guy Victor Lingo who you might say, I want to say he's the devil, but <laughs> reading this makes me scared, right? Because this shows that the economy system that we have today, the linear one, is actually made up. And made up so that we, would, we earn money from taking resources, making stuff, and then wasting them. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, of course, this, uh, also David, David Attenborough, with uh, more of a hero saying that there is no such business on an infinite planet, you have, you have your limits, right? So, uh, this is why we want to go to this. Uh, this is a picture of how we can be circular. And uh, a lot of people might think that recycling is a circle, but that won't do it all, because recycling is really hard. And even though we are pretty good at it, it's in Sweden, for example, and also Netherlands, and also some other countries, still loads of losses and not so much actually being recycled at the same sort of level of, of material that it, that it was from the beginning. So we lose a lot. Uh, and we should be focusing more on these inner circles. And I know you will hear great examples on, on how you could do that, but. It's all about keeping the resources longer. And I usually do like this with my hands. <laughs> like this is a donut, think of a donut. And you don't want a donut to grow bigger either. You want a donut to keep at the same size. Because we already know that we are extracting too much of the earth resources. So we need to stay in a certain amount here. Preferably make it smaller actually. And we want them to ride sort of slowly in a circle. Uh, so this is highly critical. We want them to stay in inner circles and then eventually when they're used, loop them out and then loop them one more time and infinitely, preferably. Which is, as I said, as I said really hard. So another way to put it, not to make it just a circle, but also to show why a circular economy could help us build something new is to... You can go with this picture all over the internet, but uh, we have the linear economy, you see we fill the, the trash can over here, the trash bin. Uh, what we are at the moment is somewhere here, so parts of it going back in recycling, but what we want to create is the spider web on the, on the right. So we have the use, we want to by design make things being being able to repair things, being able to reuse them, being able to, to have them for a long time, and so on and so forth. So that's my main message. And now I don't know, you're probably a bit more interested in the topic. So I figured I'd just give you like three things you could do when you go home to be more sustainable. So first of all, if you have taken one of these bags, or if you have one, 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 another similar bag, use this as much as you can. So basically use the stuff you have. You have loads of stuff at home, use it. Don't buy new stuff. And then if you have to buy something, please buy it from someone else, like second hand. Uh, if it breaks, repair. Uh, so, and if you have to throw it away, sometimes we do have to throw things away. Throw it in the best recycling bin that's available. I know it's hard, but, but if we try to, we will, could make that change. That's all for me. And, um, we'll have time to talk to you later again. We'll go through all the presentations first, just to make sure we get through them quickly. But thank you so much for grounding us, for positioning us. I'll take that. Yeah, or you can yeah. hand it okay. over. It's a talking stick. And yeah. uh, yes, I like this image with the donut. So it's not about having a Texas donut. I don't know if you've seen these, but it's like more a New York style. Uh, or a mini donut, better even. 
And so this whole first segment is about rounding pillars, bringing things together, the resource flows, but also the different sectors, and including the different actors having uh, research like you are. And now we're going to hear from the private sector, from a business, from an entrepreneur in the field of circular economy. Um, Matilda Jarvin from GIAP, Gottin Lursen, please come on up here and tell us more about your work. Hi everyone, nice to meet you, nice to be here. My name is Matilda and uh, as Max said, I'm running a business called GIA. You can see the logo in the corner there. So, um, this is a circular, we have a circular business model. And our business idea is quite simple. We identify linear processes and business models, and we try to develop them and we, uh, implement circular ones instead. And when we are doing that, we always have to create value, more value than we, we had before, and we always combine profit and economic growth with sustainability. So we are reusing products from different kind of sectors in Sweden. So for example, we started with the insurance companies in Sweden. I won't talk about the insurance system. But uh, just to like explain it very easily, we have a lot of broken stuff that the insurance companies can uh, take care of. But before we existed, the insurance company just paid out cash and you actually also could keep a broken product. But today, we take care of all those broken items and we repair them and refurbish them and then sell them again to another customer. So, for example, we also we take care of everything, a lot of electronics, but also like furniture and clothing and instruments and everything you can imagine. So, um, that's what, where we started. Uh, and then we also take care of broken items from logistics company. You know, stuff that's broken during transportation, we take care of them. Sometimes just the packaging is broken and the product is fine inside. Um, and we also work with e-commerce. Because today we do a lot of shopping and we're doing it online. Uh, and the returns is a big challenge for the e-commerce. Because today we have free delivery and free returns, so the volume is very large and it's very expensive to manage all these returns, so a lot of them goes to waste. And we think that's just crazy because it's new products that, you know, that they have never been used. So we take care of them too, we don't have to repair them, but we sell them again and we have a store, uh, a physical store and also an online store we sell all these products. Um, we also have a consultancy uh, uh, development where we help organizations to transform. We have a lot of companies calling us to say, oh, you work with circular economy, we want to do that too. So for example, we have a quite big client called IKEA. And they have a very linear business model. Uh, so they want to sell as cheap furniture as possible. But they have said that by 2030, they will be climate positive and also circular. So we are helping them develop a circular business model. For example, uh, if they will rent out the furniture, how will they do that? And what will we be able to pay? And how will they reverse the logistics? be developed and can we refurbish IKEA furniture and all those questions we try to find a good answer on. But IKEA is very ambitious, so it's very fun to work with that. <coughs> so this is a graph that I'm very proud of. And this shows uh, our revenue last year. It also shows our carbon dioxide savings. And this is a really important thing. In a circular economy, we have like decouple economic growth with a negative impact on the environment. Because today in the linear uh, system, we always have economic growth correlated with a negative impact on the environment. 
Because as you can see, we have turned this upside down and we have a positive impact. So we measure the waste savings we have and also the carbon dioxide uh, emission savings. And we also report that to our clients. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And now we switch, we swim across the water and go to the Netherlands where we have Andrew McHugh, who works for Metabolic in the Netherlands, but is originally from Massachusetts. And his focus is, he's a sustainability consultant there, his focus is on food systems and sustainable food system um, creation. So thank you so much for being here. Just a small hint, Metabolic is also heavily involved with the city of Baltimore, so it's interesting to see all these cross connections. And thank you so much for joining us here. It was a real uh, coincidence to have the opportunity to have you here today. So thank you for joining us, and I'll pull up your slide too. Really, thank you very much. Yeah, very happy coincidence. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew. I'm a sustainability consultant and metabolic. It's not just food systems that I focus on, it's, it's urban food systems. Uh, and actually tonight I'm going to be talking more about uh, tonight I'm going to be talking more about uh, the circular economy in practice for cities. So we are disconnected. Yeah. Um, because my background was in urban food systems. That's what you do. Um, and hopefully I'm just going to take some of the table that's been set so nicely with uh, circular economy in general and the circular economy uh, in businesses and take a look at what a circular city is. Uh, so, uh, why are we talking about cities to begin with? Uh, you may or may not be familiar with these uh, stats, but cities are sort of major linchpins uh, in the global economy. Um, they only take up a very small portion of land, uh, but they make up uh, the vast majority of consumption, of economic growth, of emissions, um, and very soon they'll be the vast majority of population living in cities as well. So, at Metabolic, we look for leverage points uh, within the global economy to transition uh, to a circular model. Um, so we're focusing a lot on cities. Um, as you've heard already, it's important right now for us to transition from a, a linear economy that is resulting in things uh, like waste, but also things like emissions and pollution. Um, it's a devaluing of the material goods that we have in our hands. Um, and there's a lot of knock-on effects from that. So we're interested in uh, diving down to the, the root causes of that linear economy and getting over to a circular economy. Um, now, if you start looking deeper into the circular economy, I think there's a recent article published saying there's 159 different definitions of the circular economy out there. Um, quite a lot of them are talking about uh, essentially zero waste. Um, materials are cycled infinitely. Uh, but we can imagine a future in which materials are cycled infinitely uh, that we don't really want to live in. It doesn't live up to our values. Um, so you could have uh, people picking trash out of trash heaps and getting all of that material back uh, into the economy, but that's not really the circular future we want to look at. Um, and the way we avoid that, the way we avoid sort of stumbling into tomorrow's problems with today's solutions, is by taking a systems approach. Um, so it's about understanding what are the root causes of waste, of human impacts, of financial uh, losses or gains, um, and of uh, environmental impacts, and digging down uh, underneath those to see what, what are the little things we can do that have disproportionate impact. I have a Rubik's Cube up there because uh, it's the easiest way to think about systems thinking. If you take uh, one color on the Rubik's Cube and uh, think of it as one single issue, emissions, or one single issue, trash, uh, to landfill. Uh, if you try to solve for that one color, you're going to scramble the whole rest of the cube. Um, so there's a real need to sort of zoom out and consider um, how the different elements uh, in a given economic system or uh, a city, for example, uh, are playing together to create the, the things we don't want and how they can play together to create the things we do want. Uh, at Metabolic, this plays into uh, our definition of the circular economy. Um, we use this just to guide our work um, with cities, with businesses, with NGOs, um, and it's based on seven pillars. You will see materials are up there as, long as, as well as energy, water, and uh, biodiversity in nature. Uh, but it's also really important that we are preserving society and culture. We are creating value other than financial value uh, that stays in the communities that are creating it, uh, and that we can support the health and well-being of those communities. Um, 
the, the circle around the edges is uh, easy to overlook, but it does contain three words. That's equity, transparency, uh, and resilience. Uh, and those are sort of emergent properties of uh, what we need to be keeping in mind with any intervention that we take. Um, our action should be upholding all three of those things um, in order to create the future we want. Real briefly, the way the Metabolic does this, we have three different divisions. We have a consulting division that works with uh, businesses, uh, city, state, uh, national governments, uh, and NGOs. We have a not-for-profit think tank that does public benefit research. Uh, and we do spin off uh, ventures from time to time, small businesses when we have uh, an immediate problem at hand and skills in our network, we just start the business and see if it can go. Because we are focused on uh, getting to real impact in the world. Um, we do this on all different scales. Uh, when we're talking about cities, uh, we're talking about individual buildings sometimes. Sometimes it's just a neighborhood. Um, sometimes it's the, the municipal entity. Uh, but often we go larger to the metropolitan region, uh, to the, the whole state. The bigger you go, um, the greater the possibilities for closing those. The more materials that you can actually connect, the more businesses that can use the waste from another business as a raw material, um, and the more impact you can have. Uh, I want to talk specifically about recent work we did uh, here in the States. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina is a boom town right now, uh, and they are running out of landfill space. Um, Last year we did a project with them called Circular Charlotte. They came to us with a problem, actually two problems. Uh, the first one was their Smart Cities Division had been tasked with figuring out what to do about the landfill space. Uh, they'll be out of it by 2030, um, no more landfill space. Um, the other thing was that any solution that could solve for that and solve for the fact that they are the city with the second lowest social mobility of the top 50 US cities. Um, so it's lots of jobs growth there right now, but it's not benefiting the locals. Um, any, any strategy that could address both those issues would be really important to them. So that's what we were looking to do uh, with Circular Charlotte, and I'd like to take the rest of the time just to talk through uh, three quick lessons from trying to get a city to transition to a circular future in practice. Um, there you go. First one is to uh, understand the system. Uh, we're talking about a systems thinking approach. Okay, what, is, what, what are we looking at? Um, the easiest way to think of this is if you set directions in Google Maps, uh, you have to know where you are first in order to get the directions to where you're going. Um, in the city, uh, we start by looking at the urban metabolism. Uh, this is the scholarly definition of it. It's all the stuff coming into the city, and all the stuff moving through the city, and all the stuff leaving the city. Uh, materials coming in, being turned into products, uh, being thrown out, processed, recycled, sent to landfill, and this stuff results in uh, growth or health impacts. Uh, or pollution, uh, depending on how it's managed. Um, what does that look like in practice? Uh, in Charlotte, we were just looking at the second half of that, the waste, uh, and this is what we came up with, uh, which is measuring all of the waste flows through the city of Charlotte, where it's coming from, what kind of material it is, where it's going, and it's not hard to see how linear this system is at the moment. You see that big red chunk in the middle on the right there? Uh, that's all the material going to landfill. Um, on top of this, we're able to start picking out, okay, where, where is the system going wrong? Uh, because Charlotte actually banned plastics going to landfill, uh, but almost all their plastics are going to landfill right now. Um, so that's a, it's a clear red flag for you to look into what to do there. Um, we call these hotspots for change. Uh, these are impact hotspots where a little bit of material is causing a lot of harm, or could be extremely beneficial uh, to incorporate into a circular business model. Um, plastics are just one of many hotspots we picked up in Charlotte. Uh, those numbers at the bottom there give you a sense of the scale. That uh, could create over a thousand jobs, 35 million in revenue for the city, uh, and save almost a million barrels of oil. So um, there you go, that's uh, economic and environmental benefits coming in at the same time. Um, this is just from picking out what's currently happening. Second thing that's very interesting when you start to look at, okay, how do you make the whole city as a system work better and connect uh, outflows of waste to inflows of raw materials is that different parts of the city are different. It sounds very obvious when you say it like that, but neighborhoods are different. They have different uh, infrastructure in place, they have different demographics, different needs, uh, different identities as well. Um, we can set, this is just sort of an abstract uh, vision for how we conceptualize this. We're looking at a city you might have some neighborhoods that are high-rise, and so uh, the buildings there and the interactions between people and businesses there will be different from areas that are low-rise. 
uh, predominantly business areas versus residential areas. Um, this helps guide uh, what you do about those hotspots for change. In Charlotte, uh, this is one of the ways we did this. We overlapped the uh, waste processing facilities and infrastructure with uh, income and uh, unemployment uh, statistics in the city to start to pick out, okay, well, if you did want to do something about this um, and use the circular economy to spur employment to raise incomes, where would you, where would you start placing the facilities? Where would you start placing the initiatives? Um, we did a very similar project at almost the exact same time in Rotterdam, uh, which was uh, looking not just at the waste, but also all the raw material coming in uh, to explore what are the job opportunities, what are the economic opportunities of the circular economy. Um, we also spatialized it there uh, and created a map like this. Um, this is just looking at a couple of waste flows in the city of Rotterdam, a couple of the businesses and facilities in the city. You can start to see how you can connect Okay, all the bread from these bakers should go to uh, either energy digestion or actually ideally to beer brewing. And all the spent grain from beer brewing should go into granola bars or something like that, uh, based off of what we know is going on in the city already. Finally, uh, to make it real, uh, Rachel mentioned traffic to Kobol earlier. Um, we're talking about building a lighthouse uh, project, an area where people can uh, interact with these ideas, give their feedback on it, understand what we mean when we talk about a circular city. In Amsterdam, uh, this is a, a drawing of Café de Kerbel, uh, which was one of our first projects. This was a polluted shipyard. Uh, we won a 10-year lease uh, for a circular development of this shipyard. Uh, it was a consortium of local organizations. We did the construction ourselves. We couldn't get the permit to uh, rezone the houseboats on land, so we just renovated them on the water and then pulled them up from houseboats into uh, office buildings. Uh, they are all off the energy grid, off the water grid, uh, trading resources amongst them. Uh, we've got a greenhouse, a cafe, uh, artist studios, and startup offices there. It's become a real anchor of the, of the community. We're there all the time. Uh, the reason I bring it up is that it provides a positive experience in the circular economy for community members uh, and really sort of drives growth in that area. This neighborhood has become uh, major circular lighthouse in Amsterdam uh, since then. Charlotte's doing something similar with their innovation bar, which is under construction right now. Rotterdam has Blue City. Um, it's a known sort of way for engaging the community and uh, being the, the physical touch point for a transition to a circular city. These are business cases. I won't go into too depth there in our, uh, in our report on Circular Charlotte, but you can actually pull out all the opportunities of the circular economy in very specific sectors. Uh, construction, uh, agri-food waste, and uh, plastics often being the top targets. Finally, uh, I would hope that we could have an integrated approach to the circular economy in the city, because um, it can have all these benefits depending on uh, what's going on in Baltimore versus in another city. Uh, maybe connecting between cities like Rotterdam and Baltimore can lead to uh, a, whole, a, sum, a whole that is greater than some of its parts. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution on rounding the pillars. Now we're going back to Baltimore with a new focus in the program on rebuilding communities, on community engagement and social entrepreneurship. And our first speaker here, up here already, is Jane English, Program Manager at the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Thank you. Greetings. I bring greetings from our uh, Chairman, Leon Russell, our President and CEO, Derek Johnson, and our esteemed leader in the environmental and climate justice movement, as well as our organization, Jackie Patterson, and our whole team. So, I have a lot of slides, so some of them I'll flip through, uh, but some of them I will maybe leave just for a few minutes. So, this program has been in place for 10 years. <clears throat> so we're embarking on what we're calling a decade of transformation and liberation. Um, we have three strategic objectives. Reducing harmful emissions, uh, advancing clean and efficient energy, and strengthening community resilience uh, in the context of climate adaptation. We have eight toolkits that we distribute to our base in the United States. 
We're in, we have 22 branches throughout 50 states. And for each of these, we're able to talk about the various uh, things, like fumes across the fence line, for one thing. We did that with the Clean Air Task Force. One of the things we figured out about doing this work, and why I'm so interested in the circular economy, and how the equity lens is applied in the uh, circular economy, is that what fumes did, uh, it really pointed to all of the pollution coming across the fences and who it was impacting the greatest. And it's people of color communities and low income communities. The same is true about our cold blood uh, toolkit. Cold blooded uh, is about the uh, coal power plants in the United States, profits before people, right? And so we evaluated 378 uh, coal fire power plants and we worked to shut them down with some other high powered. <laughs> some <laughs> green organizations in the United States. And so our branches get out there on the front lines uh, with people because we have so many millions of people living within three miles of those coal fire power plants. In the eye of the storm, we're also uh, in the areas where the storms hit the most and we anticipate that these storms will increase with great frequency uh, based on climate change alone. So they won't just be sim uh, simply weather events but the condition of the planet. Um, and we also have a youth and college division. Our key one right now is our communities, our power action toolkit, and that's about our resistance and resilience. And I can go on through that. I won't you know, go through all of this, but Florida, we have 28 uh, environmental climate justice committees in Florida. And for Baltimore, we just had an environmental justice, environmental climate justice chair appointed here about two weeks ago. We are training uh, people on resistance and resilience. Uh, we just had a training, we've trained 15 people recently. Uh, we had eight before, and these are branches that are on the ground, everywhere from Alaska to Hawaii to uh, Baltimore now and Howard County, and a number of the places. We just did sea level rise training this weekend on the, on the, on the Eastern Shore. Uh, there are nine branches of NAACP there in desperate need of sea level rise plans. And we have unit leadership. This was, a, uh, we did our own talk show <laughs> at the national convention. And now it's a big to do, yeah? At the time, we just thought we were doing something cute. Well, it's no longer just cute. <laughs> People come to hear it and, and want us to really give amazing uh, information. We are really working with our branches to get our word out in various magazines and, and doing op-eds and working on books. Mm -hmm. um, Kathy Eglin is the chair of our Environmental and Climate Justice Committee for the board. She just recently did, um, well not just recently actually, she did it when it first happened. She did an, an op-ed on the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. And of course we are horrendously uh, disappointed in that. And we're gonna work with our every breath and our every strength to restore our uh, place at the table for the Paris, Paris Agreement. You may, some of you may, and I think maybe most of us, uh, we talk about being an unbought and unbossed. And this was the campaign slogan of Shirley Chisholm, who was the first black person and first black woman to run, maybe the first woman, to run for president of the United States in 1972. So we have what we call the Unbought, Unbossed series. Um, we always believe that the people shall lead. Just like the circular economy that you were speaking of, it won't be circular if the people aren't leading on the ground. If it's not real to communities, to neighbors, to institutions, then we don't have much hope. So our belief is that we have to center our training and center our work in frontline communities. This is the uh, most recent planning resistance and really resilience training we had here in Baltimore last week. That's more of the training that was going on, of course, and that was the class. Today in uh, Virginia Beach, uh, we have a, a centering equity in the sustainable building sector manager, uh, Mandy Lee, Samantha Lee, and she put together this group and a number of other people because the NAACP in about 10 years will have a green building. We will have a state-of-the-art green building. Our headquarters will be green. And what we're doing is working with people to understand what does it mean to have a sustainable building. And these are grassroots leaders. Some are Last year we had like the architects and all the scientists involved. Some were there too. That's, they're still there working on this. She sent me that this afternoon. And of course, I just have to have like women lead. <laughs> okay, diversity is not enough. And if done alone, it can be counterproductive. In other words, you can't do it by yourself. If you try to do it by yourself, you're standing in place. 
But we know what happens there. You do nothing. But something's going to go forward and something's going to go back. If you try to do it alone, it'll go back. We have a number of initiatives. One of the big ones is the Black Green Pipeline, because we talk about how people are going to get integrated into the green economy. Because every time we've had a transition in this country, when it involved people of color, and it involved African Americans and specifics, and, and indigenous people in this country, we have been on the losing end of transition. All you have to do is look at this wonderful <clears throat> popular education board up here, and you can see where every transition took place. And just look at the uh, statistics of what's happening with us now. So we can't play games about what that means. In fact, our allies in this generation is not going to stand for it in the first place. That's our team. <laughs> what I want to thank you for is for listening. Uh, and please lift up equity uh, wherever you go. Uh, if, you, if you have a question about what that should look like, call us. We'll help you sort it out. Um, and we hope to see you in the venues. Thank you. And I can only see on that without the people, without getting the communities not only on board but in the driving seat. Yes. Uh, that's really essential. So we're not talking about taking them along but having them lead. So it's really important. Um, we're going to continue this discussion with our next speaker, a social entrepreneur working, working with communities. Um, in his very own way. So Dan Wittepoel here from the Netherlands is a serial entrepreneur and will talk about his baby here being the network for sharing things. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. All right, okay. Um, yeah, hello, my name is uh, Dan Wittepoel. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, Kirby. And, um, before I talk about my company, I'd like to talk a little bit about what inspired me to, uh, to do what I'm, what I'm doing today. Um, it, it started a few years ago. I was a, a, a CTO, so like a technical director for a software company. I had a really lovely, lovely life with a lovely house and a nice car. And then from one day to the other, and a lot of stuff, and then one day to the other, this happened. Uh, my house burned down. Um, and um, so it means that I lost all my stuff, but at the same time also my, my job ended. The car that came with that job was gone uh, because of the stress of the fire. Uh, it had a negative uh, impact on, uh, on my relationship. And from one day to, to another, basically I was left with nothing. And, uh, well this is not actually what, what nothing looks like in reality, this, this is more what nothing looks like. Um, so, I, I went from being very independent and, and sort of proud of that to uh, having to learn a new skill. I had to uh, learn how to ask for help. Uh, I was borrowing stuff, I was sleeping on people's couches, and while I was sort of restocking my life, I, I realized, um, well, a few things. I realized, one, if you ask, dare to ask for help, a lot of people are actually happy to share. A lot of people are happy to help. And I discovered that it really strengthened my relationship with the people around me. And it was, it was kind of beautiful. Uh, another thing I realized is that I was, in order to restock my life, I was probably going to spend about $5,000 on stuff I would hardly ever need. Uh, and, and that sort of, this, this whole combination of things got me thinking. Um, what would happen if more people dared to ask for help, if, we, if more people were okay with being a little, a little more interdependent? What if these uh, houses weren't separated by walls, but what if we had little car corridors and we could walk from one house to the other? And then I realized we would probably see almost identical households with uh, so many similar items, you know? Uh, so many uh, uh, barbecues and tents and, and tools and, and, and bikes and, and, and so much stuff. Um, that, that is pretty much the, the same everywhere. Um, and most of that stuff sits idle most of the time. Uh, take this power drill, for example. We use about 3% of the capacity of an average power drill. So 
I thought there's going to be a, a smarter way to do things. What if, what if we could enable people to access all this capacity that's available? We have every power to us, 97% capacity that we could share with someone. So that's uh, what I set up to build. Uh, a, a platform, a website, an app to enable people to share that idle capacity. Uh, and the initial idea was uh, was like this: What if what if you can ask for help if you need a bigger backpack or you need a power drill? You you post that request. We send that out in the neighborhood. And then if a neighbor uh, sees that request, they can say yes, I have it. We connect them in a chat, and then people can meet up and and borrow each other's stuff. So the first time I pitched this, a lot of people told me oh, it was crazy and that nobody wanted to share. Nobody was ever going to share stuff. Just stop. Wait already, this is, this is ridiculous. Uh, but some people uh, believed it could work. Um, and one of those people was actually uh, this uh, American uh, minister here called Jerry, who you might uh, recognize if I say he's, uh, he's a good friend of Ben. Um, and uh, he and, and, and some other people put in a little money and we tried to actually to make this work. And at first it was tough, it, it wasn't easy to to sort of create this app and, and, and figure out how we could sort of stimulate people, get enough people to, to, to actually use it and sign up and then connect them. But after a while, uh, after, actually after months and months of work at failing at first, uh, suddenly we had the first two people that actually shared something. These are, these are our actual customers one and two. On the, on the left is Ruben, he's, uh, he's an artist. And he was working on a wooden sculpter. And on the right is Danielle. Um, and uh, she owns a power, uh, uh, a power saw, like an electric saw. And uh, Ruben needed one, and they found each other through the website. And from that moment on, we started to figure out more and more how we could sort of connect people to share stuff locally. You know, really neighbor to neighbor, sometimes very close together. Um, and from, you know, from, from tools and, 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 and all kinds of uh, here, like, like pet uh, accessories to, uh, to clothing. And, and we discovered that there's much more that you can share than you initially uh, can come up with. There's so many things that people can share. Um, so I'm really excited that we're now offering the opportunity for this power drill to not be a, a power drill that's, you know, that we, basically that we, we uh, that we over consume, but to create the opportunity for this power drill to be a power drill that can be used by 32 people. Um, and that's not just great because it connects people, but also the, the impact of sharing a single uh, item once is pretty big. Um, this, uh, this is some, some, these are some calculations that were done for an average product. It's really hard to come up with an average product, but we decided it's a vacuum cleaner because it's somewhere between a hammer and an RV. Um, <laughs> But you can see that just, and this is just sharing it once, uh, it generates a lot of uh, a positive uh, impact, a lot of savings. Um, and I believe it's also probably one of the most effective ways uh, to create a more uh, sustainable uh, way of consuming household items. Um, you can recycle items, you can try to uh, take, the, take them apart at the end of the life cycle and reuse them. Um, but recycling takes a lot of energy, a lot of the materials are harder to, to really keep at the same sort of quality level or reuse. So, so the, the best and quickest way to you know, reduce the amount of products we need and to keep and, and sort of optimize the usage of resources is to just use the same product multiple times and have, have it used by a lot of people. Um, so we're starting peer to peer, meaning you know, it's people sharing among each other, but um, we want, to, uh, we want uh, manufacturers to get involved because we believe that we need to start providing uh, the right incentive for manufacturers to create products that are actually designed for this kind of sharing. Because right now, most products are designed for obsolescence, I would say pretty much all products. Um, and so what we're doing uh, at the moment is we're piloting with Gerhard, which is uh, uh, one of Europe's well, probably Europe's biggest pressure washer manufacturer, one of the products that are, are popular on the platform. And we asked them to uh, provide us with some products that we could uh, basically share on the network. Uh, and we share the profits with them. So we don't pay them for the products up front. We share um, uh, the, the, the part, a percentage of the rental income 
Meaning that if they start designing products that last long, that are easy to repair and that are easy to share, um, they can end up earning more per product than uh, what they earn today if they sell it at retail price. And we're, we're starting to see some signals that this is actually the case. So we're trying to create a positive uh, business case for them so that the, they'd be crazy if they uh, don't go certain. Um, and and the, one of the other pilots we're running right now in, uh, in Belgium is taking these products and no longer having uh, people have to go from, from uh, like to their neighbor and back, uh, but to have the products sort of, sort of float. So uh, it starts at person A and it goes to person B, it goes to person C. And so these products are sort of moving through town, so free floating products. Um, and you know, this is this is sort of what I like to call the, the, the a minimal viable ecosystem. Like we have we have sharing, and that's sort of the we, we need a person that owns something. We need a person that needs that product, and that's the smallest loop we can create. But we'd like to add a lot more steps to that loop. We'd like to enable people to uh, get get a product uh, recycled through the app, get a product uh, uh, get maintenance for for your product through the app. Um, and, and, and start storing, storing that data and selling, uh, uh, or not selling the data, but uh, enabling people to use that data um, uh, so that they can determine what, the, what the, the actual lifetime value of a product is. So if you know, uh, if there's public data about what, uh, um, uh, how often do, do products fail, or uh, you know, how good are they, then we can start uh, picking products that actually are, are circular, last a long time, uh, and end up with products that are no longer designed for obsolescence, but uh, reach a point where uh, all products are built for people and planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. And we really great to see these examples and how they were motivated by very, very sad personal experience. But um, now we hear more about building communities through sharing, sharing skills, and experiences. Martin Postmar, the creator, the innovator of the Repair Cafe, uh, just celebrated 10 years uh, Repair Cafe. So welcome here. Thank you for joining us from the Netherlands. I'll pull up your slides right away. Thank you. Repair Café uh, concept, which is uh, designed to show people that a more circular lifestyle is within reach, that it's nice, that you can have it too in your daily life, in your community. Um, my name is Martina Postma, and I'm the founder of the Repair Café International Foundation. We're based in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And from there, we've been spreading the repair cafe concept around the world. So this is uh, what a repair cafe looks like. It's a free repair meeting organized by and for civilians on a voluntary basis. It is usually very much fun. You learn about repairing. You see that you can do it too. You have a chat. You have a cup of coffee or tea. And as a reward, in the end, um, you go home with an object which is no longer broken, but that you can use again and benefit from. <coughs> Repair Café addresses a problem that many people in the Western world, and especially also here in the US, will recognize, uh, which is that things break, and when they do, many people just don't know what to do anymore, because they don't have repair skills, they have no tools at home, and they have no time to focus on the subject. So when a product breaks, many people are simply helpless. Now at the same time, there are still some people in every community who do have those skills and who do have the tools and who have been making repairs at home uh, in their shed for decades, teaching themselves and finding out how things work and helping their entire family. And these people, they are so fond of fixing and, and discovering and tinkering that they are more than happy to help their neighbors too. So that's the idea of Repair Café. Um, repair experts gather at the community center or 
at another central location, like maybe in here, it could work very well too. Um, they bring their tools and they invite the neighborhood to show up there too. So then people who have broken items but don't know how to repair them, they can come there and they take a seat at the table with the expert and they try to examine the object together to find out what's wrong, how does this thing work and what can we do to fix it. And that's a very inspiring activity actually. Um, I've been, I, I thought up this, this concept 10 years ago in 2009 and um, I decided to test it in practice once. This was a great success. It turned out that many people um, wanted to go to such a meeting and that it really inspired them. And then um, afterwards people approached me and asked, asked me, couldn't, couldn't we have some coffee once and could you give me some advice on how I can get this in, in my community uh, too? So then I thought, um, Yes, I can do that, but I cannot have coffee with everyone. So I um, decided to write a manual on, on how to organize your own repair cafe. And um, I started a repair cafe foundation. And I started spreading this, um, this concept via the manual and the starter kit, which is now available in, in seven languages via our website, repaircafe.org. And uh, this has so far resulted in almost 2,000 repair cafe groups in 35 countries across the world, and there's over 100 here in, in the US already. Um, and there is one here in the vicinity of, of Baltimore, it's several more starting up, and there is definitely room for many, many more here and everywhere across the US. So uh, that's one of my hopes that many people will start more repair cafes here in the US too. Um, for, through the repair cafe, various goals are reached at the same time. Uh, sustainable goals, when you repair an object, you can use it for longer, you don't have to throw it away, it doesn't become waste, the raw materials that were used to, to create the product are saved, and it also means that when you can use a, a current, uh, an existing product for longer, then you don't have to uh, spend energy and, and new raw materials to create new products. And this saves energy, it also saves CO2 emissions, so all that is good for the environment. But apart from that, there are more goals, uh, more effects, uh, like social goals. Um, neighbors get connected once more in a, in a new and, and inspiring way and also people who have repair skills um, in any case they're older people, retired or unemployed they are acknowledged as, as valuable people who have valuable skills and that's very important too it, it's, um, for repairers it's, it's very um, uh, inspiring to, to be volunteering at a repair cafe because they are the hero of the day at the Repair Cafe because they can do the things that you and I cannot. So it's um, uh, good to, to, to um, uh, acknowledge that and to show that they are, they are valuable people. Um, and for the visitors, it's, it's an inspiring thing too. Um, by making a repair, you see that, um, well, you see that it's, it's possible, you see it's, it's an option for you too and that you can learn how to do it, and that it's fun to discover how something works and how you can fix it. So and this gradually changes your, your mindset, your mentality, and it shows you that a circular lifestyle is, is not abstract, it's not difficult or something far away, but that it's something for you too in your daily life, in your community, and you can start right away, you can start tonight, you can start tomorrow, you can start your own repair cafe. And this will motivate people for a more circular lifestyle with, with less waste and more care for products and for the people in your community and ultimately also for the planet. So that's how I hope we can all move forward to a more sustainable world. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And yes, I hope I hope we can see many more repair cafes all over the country and the planet. Um, we have one more speaker, and then you're through with the with the import part. So, so hold on. It's just one more, and it's a great one. Neil Seltman from the Institute for Local Self Reliance. Thank you for Thank joining you. us here. Thank you, Max. I appreciate it. It's wonderful hearing. Thank you. It's wonderful hearing such creative stuff happening in Europe and the United States. Um, I just wanted to mention Baltimore is a very exciting place to be. There are good, being major transitions in our solid waste uh, system. Um, all credit to grassroots organizing. I want to recognize um, Rodette Jones from Filbert uh, Street. Uh, been uh, the leader in, in Baltimore in keeping incinerators out and in attacking uh, existing incinerators and they've got a great compost enterprise going. Miss um, Kelton over here represents uh, Energy Justice Network. <laughs> Mike Ewald from Energy Justice Network was here earlier. I think he's planning on coming back. Yeah. He wrote the Clean Air Act that passed the City Council unanimously last, last year or a year and a half ago. And um, we, uh, we're in the process of uh, re releasing a zero waste plan that was um, uh, initiated by United Workers of Baltimore, which is another Curtis Bay-based organization, which has uh, really, in their fight to defeat the plant that was supposed to be in Curtis Bay, they mobilized the whole city. Uh, and now we hope to be able to shut down the existing incinerator. Um, I, I want to point out that there's a difference between the way Europeans and Americans, or at least I should say Baltimoreans, but I think most Americans. Um, we are striving for zero waste in Baltimore, which means 90% reduction of the waste stream without incineration. Uh, the, the city has been victimized by incineration, not only from garbage, but from hazardous waste and medical waste incinerators. And thanks to the Clean Air Act, that, yeah, the Baltimore Clean Air Act, we may see those facilities being shut down because of the inordinate amount of pollution. Uh, it's costing uh, $55 million a year in hospital visits, and uh, you can read all about it. Uh, it's, uh, what's going on is well documented. Also, we're about to release um, our zero waste plan, but we really would like people to give us feedback on it. So if you would like to see the draft plan uh, that has been created by many, many interviews, with community people in the, in the city. Um, we will be very happy to get that to you, and we really would appreciate your uh, input. So um, I'll make sure that Max, well, Max does have, have my information. If you want to get a copy of the current draft report, give us feedback, um, it will uh, we'll be happy to do it. The city itself is pr producing its own uh, report, and um, uh, we think there's going to be quite a difference in the two reports. Uh, they, I'm understating that as this gentleman <laughs> could appreciate. Um, so uh, Baltimore is a very exciting uh, place to be when it comes to garbage and we think uh, we're going to be uh, showing the rest of the country what uh, grassroots people can do in their own ways. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leo. I think now we heard uh, a lot of input and you probably have questions and feedback and comments. So we want to open this right now. And we have two microphones. Um, one, one more, two more. And, and uh, Brendan and I will be kind of moderating in between you. And yeah, just, I can give you mine. So does anybody have any initial questions or comments that they'd like to respond to what the speaker has said so far. Please, uh, if you introduce yourself. Um. Good evening, my name is Glenn Flickin, John Lincoln, City Planning Department. And you know, we keep talking about pulling out the parents of the media. But a lot of the literature now is talking about how metropolitan areas are the future. And we see that states and localities are passing their own laws. So, you know, this whole regional approach, I don't know if anybody has any comments on how we can not actually just Baltimore, but our region 
to be a leader in this, regardless of what the, they're doing in Annapolis or Washington. So who would want to answer this? Um, Anne? I don't know. She's still she's, oh, she's just not right here right now. Good. Okay, well, I can't answer for the state of Maryland or, or for the region. Uh, of course, we do hope that, and we do hope that we don't have to, you know, wait and see till change happens at a different level, but to have it not just in a city, but in a whole region. We know this as ourselves. We went to Howard County, and so the city needs to also work with the surrounding counties or the other way around. Surrounding counties have to work with the city. Nobody can win this alone. Um, we've heard this multiple times. Only together can we make this change happen. And nobody can just storm off. You mentioned this. You can't do change alone, Jane. You said that. So only as a team, and that means also with the surrounding region. Do you want to add to this, Jane? Do you want to add to the county or the region? Uh, there's a few people in this audience that know this area much better than I do. Um, I do travel throughout the country. Um, what I would like to say though is Baltimore is a, is a North Star on um, people organizing, uh, both on labor issues as well on um, environmental issues. And so there's someone from Baltimore who's leading um, to, uh, they got the uh, incinerator shut down, uh, and also the one that's working on the one now, that I prefer to uh, build it like to the local group. Great cue. Mike is just in the door. I think he just got here. Mike, Mike, are you ready? Mike Ewald? Yeah? A Energy Justice Coalition? Network, sorry, sorry about that. Hi everyone, um, I was hoping to have another minute, maybe tuck my shirt in. I <laughs> just had to drop someone off, so um, thanks for making a couple minutes for me. Um, so, my name is Mike Ewald, I'm the founder and director of the national group called Energy Justice Network, I'm based in Philadelphia, and we've been doing a lot of work over the past several years here in Baltimore. <coughs> A um, couple um, quick claims to fame, I guess you can say. Um, one is that I am the one who invented the zero waste hierarchy, which we have some copies. It's this rainbow triangle um, that you'll see on one of the papers back there. Um, this is something that is now used um, by the Zero Waste International Alliance and used for green business certification around the world as an international standard. Um, so I work in coordination um, with folks like me all work for these years. Um, and others at the Zero Waste International Alliance um, that sets those standards and um, creates the idea of what zero waste actually means. Um, there's a lot of confusion around that. Um, we'll get to in a second. Um, another claim of fame, and we also have a handout on that back here, is the Baltimore Clean Air Act. Um, I'm now an attorney, but um, that's not the main hat I wear. Um, but I'm primarily an organizer, a researcher, a speaker, and do a lot of things. Um, but I wrote a bill called the Baltimore Clean Air Act, and it was passed unanimously by Baltimore City Council in February, signed into law um, by the mayor in March before her scandal um, took things over, so it was a great time. Um, so that, <laughs> that law was expected to force the closure of both the trash incinerator here in Baltimore, which is the largest air polluter by far in the city, and also the nation's largest medical waste incinerator. There used to be 6,200 in the country 30 years ago. Now there are about 20, and this counts as two of them. And it takes medical waste from about 20 states plus D.C. and Canada. And this law would force both facilities to meet the strictest standards that exist in North America for four different pollutants, and to continuously monitor 20 different pollutants real time, not just three, and put on a website for the world to see. So there's real information on what people are breathing. And this is intolerable to industries like this because they don't want to have that information transparent. They don't want to invest the money that it would take to be state of the art when these plants were permitted about 30 years ago and operating under those kinds of standards. And so, um, just testified earlier today where the state is working on setting standards so weak that it would only require this big polluter to reduce one pollutant, nitrogen oxide, to the point where it's only going to cost them 0.2% of their annual profits. So an annual income, rather. And bring things down from 
a level of about 166 parts per million to about 150, when new incinerators have to do 45. And so the Baltimore Clean Air Act says 45 is the standard. That's what the new facility would have to do, that's what you're going to have to do. It doesn't matter that they gave you a permit 30 years ago that says you can get away with being dirtier because you're old. So that is now the law of the land, and we expect both of these incinerators will shut down in September when the law kicks in. Um, which was the point, so that we can move Baltimore towards zero waste. One of the things that we find is that we can't shut down incinerators by working on zero waste. The order is backwards. You need to work on zero waste by shutting down the obstacles that are in the way. And incinerators are an obstacle to that because their contracts to require a certain amount of wasting. They penalize jurisdictions if they don't give them a certain amount of waste. And that's one of the reasons um, why no one does mechanics in Sweden exactly, but I know Sweden has an issue where they're importing trash from other countries just to feed all the burners that they have, because they've overbuilt and built too many and rely on them for district here. Um, so they're not really avoiding landfills. Um, I think you heard earlier that only 1% of the waste in Sweden goes to landfills. Um, I hear about that kind of information here as well, not 1%, but they pretend that when you burn things, it's not going to the landfill. But in fact, all you're doing is for every 100 tons you burn, you put 70 tons in the air as air pollution, and 30 tons become toxic ash, or still go to a landfill, and are actually worse than if you put the waste straight into a landfill. And so it's important to understand that incineration is far worse than direct use of landfills. It doesn't avoid landfills. It just spends a lot more money and create a lot more pollution. And so we have a fact sheet back there as well that explains why that's the case. Happy to answer any questions about it. Happy to work with anyone that wants to work and join the um, movement here in Baltimore for zero waste. Thank you. Thank you. That's of course a very, very interesting statement uh, from a European perspective. Hard, hard to uh, fully, fully be on that same page, but I think it's interesting to see and hear that. And we heard and read about this before, of course, how this is a real challenge here: the pollution. Uh, also, the incinerators are in place in communities who are directly affected, and it seems like almost like people didn't care when they put the incinerators there. So we have more time for feedback and comment. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so sorry, I don't want to come out as the incinerator defender in any way because I'm not. I'm I truly agree that we should reduce, you're right, when you say that we don't get problems on the landfills, but we do burn a lot, right? So, but every life cycle analysis, if you do them in the correct way, if you have the, because we have high standards on the treatment of the uh, gases, shows that incineration is less polluting than landfills. It's what makes it clear from a scientific point of view. I don't want to go into the debate on that. Analysis, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't want to go into the debate on that. I just want to say that there's another picture. And also that we have plenty of... It's true, we import a lot and whatever we do. And I'm not proud of that. But it's it's not that they're polluting the society surrounding in Sweden. That's just not the case. So I just want to make that clear. I think it's a very good point that we also have different opinions and different viewpoints. And I think it really also matters, of course, what kind of incinerator we talk about. However, taking a step back, going to the primary ideas of the circular economy and the donut, we all agree we should actually not have anything to throw in the landfill or into an incinerator. And of course, tonight, if we, we tried that with having actual plates, uh, and cutlery and and uh, also glasses and hopefully no food waste but it is very difficult like we do a lot of events and it is a challenge very often you ask oh we want to do zero waste and then the response is okay you get compostables it's a default answer and in most places there's either no composting or if there is they can't compost what's labeled as compostable. This just goes right through and ends up in the landfill or in the incinerator, and it's just like, so you feel better, in a, in a way. And that's sad. Um, of course it's great because the compostables are made at least from oil, and so that's a, that's a step there, maybe, yeah? But then you have a whole set of other problems. So I think we really need to make more efforts it's tough, but we need to make efforts um, 
I really think we need to also work more with other people because like this year uh, we had to get of course multiple people together like the caterer and somebody to bring the plates so it's then all of a sudden not one so you can't do it all alone or you just have to throw away stuff right um, so more questions or comments feedbacks uh, on, on our Europeans or on our American speakers or on the situation in general, you can also talk about what your perspective is on the state of recycling, reusing, and waste avoidance in, in Baltimore and your homes. Any, anybody? Otherwise, I can ask you questions. Oh, yeah, sorry. Working. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Laura Armstrong with the Maryland Department of Environment and the Director of the Sustainability Program. And um, great presentations, lots of things to think about here. One of the biggest things I struggle with in my position working with businesses across the state is uh, the lack of industrial waste exchange here in Maryland. There's been various attempts at it. Um, there are other states that have set them up. The key is transportation distance. And it's really frustrating. We do sustainability assessments, and um, very often we have a, come across a waste stream um, that probably has some value, but I'm left without a whole lot of tools um, to help with that. Sometimes send them to the North Carolina Waste Exchange or the Midwest, and there are some um, sort of for profit groups that are um, you know, trying to move in various states and offer programs. Um, I'm of a mind that we ought to just stick it on the Google Doc and just say, you know, this what you have, buyer beware, and it's on. Um, but it is a true start on the um, So I, I think this might be something, you know, you've looked at probably in Circuit River or Charlotte, but for any of the speakers, um, this is something we really need to tackle right now, not just Baltimore, the whole state. Do you want to respond to that right away? Um, sure, I'll, uh, I'll speak to it as best I can. Um, yes, actually commercial waste is one of the most important things, one of the most important opportunities uh, for what we call byproduct utilization. There are some actually good networks doing that here in the U.S. as well. Um, for us, yeah, that comes after the first assessment of what's what's there. Um, so uh, when we talk about the different scales of neighborhood, city, or regional level, and a regional level is obviously a lot more industry happening. Um, and if you get, um, actually, this was speaking to your question earlier about how do you get a regional uh, impact, uh, public partner, private, public private partnerships um, actually are the best way to sort of solicit that data from uh, companies and then start to connect the dots between them. Um, another way to approach it is with the lighthouse uh, industrial park. So industrial parks are a very common tool of development in the EU. Um, doing industrial symbiosis in those parks is a way to get uh, companies that may have dozens of facilities to at least sort of try it with one um, and sort of build from that. This is how we've come across it in the past. I'm not sure if that quite answered your question. Um, but it is a super important Excellent. And of course, you know, we talked a lot about the consumer perspective here, the household perspective, but a lot of the initiatives they, they relate then also to commercial ways. Like uh, the work Matilda does is reducing basically through the online shopping that's affected. There's less commercial ways there. Um, and what we see also of course, it's the whole field we didn't talk about, construction waste, it's a huge in volume, it's a huge aspect, um, because we still build new buildings, and uh, there's still a need or a felt perceived need to build new buildings and tear down the old ones. Um, we've seen some really great examples traveling here in the US of reusing, which is today we were at um, the loading dock, and um, really great things. Um, and of course, we need to think more that way about that everything is a resource. And I think some, some of 
what we've seen here today is, is about exemplifying this, that there is no ways, it's just maybe I can't use it, maybe somebody else can use it. And that's of course more easily said for individuals than maybe at the commercial scale, but then we need more holistic analysis, going deeper, looking at the numbers, but there's still ways to do that. Well, I, I was just wondering, Matilda, if you would talk a little bit more, you know, you talk about identifying linear processes in, in, in corporations and companies, and then trying to find a circular process to replace that, to implement that. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean? What is a circular process for an industrial client of yours, for example? What could that look like? And if you have something to say to that, because I know uh, reefs and, and waste streams is your uh, Yes, uh, in our cases, it's been a lot of reducing producing products. So we identify products that our clients, they see those products as waste, and we turn them into uh, a um, uh, product with a higher economic value or win value. Um, so that's what we've been doing, but we have transformed, for example, the claims, uh, the insurance companies to them, they have a linear process where they just pay out cash and the products go to waste. And now we see for some smartphones, instead of getting cash, you get a repair phone back. So we have a circle of smartphones around three, four hundred every day. Uh, so we try to, yeah, it, it sounds easy, but sometimes it's very difficult. But, and of course, it's, we exist because there's so much waste. And we would like that
Yeah, and then maybe that's what you should do. Like yeah. start this and see what happens. Exactly. It's also something that we sometimes we strive for the perfect solution before we're moving. That's but we exactly need to start right. moving a little bit. Yes. Oh, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Carrie. I am a musician, so I have no um, technical or industrial expertise in any of this. Um, I'm merely a concerned citizen. And I just wanted to bring the focus here to Baltimore because I think ultimately all of us, whether we're on um, sort of an industry level or on a concerned citizen level, would like to come away from tonight with some kind of appliable um, or implementable actions, um, certainly on a personal level. I compost and I try to avoid buying food um, more than I need, things like that. Um, I really appreciate the comments that were made about repurposing items. Um, you mentioned your um, client IKEA and um, the sharing the, um, of tools um, with the app. I can't see right now. <laughs> yes. So we have the Station North Tool Library here, just around the corner. Um, so this is one example that um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with in Baltimore that is starting to implement this kind of um, item sharing um, system, um, which I've used um, because I'm not very tool savvy, so they offer classes as well. Um, I don't work for them, I'm not endorsing <laughs> them, I'm just merely bringing that up as an example. Um, but I'm also thinking about, um, on the grassroots levels, we, we all acknowledge that's going to be the, sort of the source of a lot of this power and a lot of this um, sort of energy going forward. Um, so looking at Baltimore and looking at these little pockets of where community has come together and even where industry has come together. So I'm thinking um, our strengths in the city of um, the tech incubators, so getting these companies on board, getting these organizations on board, um, and even neighborhood organizations, neighborhood, um, what are they called? Um, community systems, exactly. So where people are coming together to solve problems. Um, so again, it's not, it's sort of bringing it from the industry level, it certainly has its own challenges, but very much to the neighborhood level, to the in individual household level, um, because I think that empowers the individual to have um, sort of, as I said, implementable, tasks and steps that they can, can bring forth. So um, I can think of a million examples of organizations that already exist that are harnessing that grassroots power. Um, I'm sure all of you have your own long list that you can come up with. Um, so I just suggest, um, without this being a preformed idea, um, sort of coming together for some kind of um, collective list or um, shareable um, sort of clearinghouse of information, um, and I don't even suggest who would be the correct organization to do that. I merely put it out there that that's kind of the direction. Um, certainly, that an event like this, um, sort of clearinghouse of information, um, and I don't even suggest who would be the correct organization to do that. I merely put it out there that that's kind of the direction. Um, certainly, that an event like this. Um, um, that's the direction that we should be going, and an event like this can be kind of a catalyst for that. And I merely hope that other people can kind of give input as to maybe the best practices for that. Thank you. Wonderful. I think it's a great idea. I totally support that. So I'm Jonathan Felston. Um, I've been doing a mapping project called Baltimore Green Map for quite a while, and one of the maps that I have started and I've gradually accumulate information for it is the recycle reuse share map. It's a geographically based, what's out there, what can you do, where is it, how do you get there? So great, there's a starting point, but I think you, you also meant um, more than just uh, looking at the map, but then adding different layers, so maybe we can combine these. Yeah? that already exist, the groups that are already in place that have people power, and rather than reinventing the wheel. Yeah, I think it's, it's a great approach also to get as many people on board as possible, again, going with what Jean said, you can't do it alone. Did anybody here have their hand up? Oh, yes. yes. I 
just have a question regarding um, looking at what's happening in China specifically, where now they're charging their uh, residents with that they're not recycling appropriately as far as separating the appropriate, and they still have a social network, which I guess you're rated now as far as, um, you know, are you recycling appropriately? Or, it goes beyond that as well, as far as socially. But I'm just uh, concerned about the what I've seen, at least in the U.S. in general, and maybe it has a lot to do with our administration. But I've really seen this dip in recycling because all of a sudden China's not taking the recycles from the U.S. anymore. And I don't think that people have a clear idea of what to recycle, how to recycle as far as cleaning, you know, before they go in. It becomes another job in the sense of the uh, our sort of daily lifestyle. So I'm just wondering how you're handling it, at least in Europe, with the sort of sense of you having people being accountable by fees or anything of that nature there. And if it's something that culturally we have to begin to think about here, you know, charging or socially marking of some sorts. Yeah, after you want to talk to that because you work with governments. Mm, okay, so um, so we have we have the same problem in Europe. We also exported a lot to China and other uh, Asian countries, which no longer uh, accepts these kinds of uh, materials. Which is a good thing because we we sort of kept the good stuff and gave them the bad stuff, and they ended up with something that they could recycle, but many things that they couldn't. And uh, what's happening? I just read a report by the. European Environmental Agency, and uh, they are now highly stating that we have an, an, a too low capacity for sorting and recycling in, in Europe. But they are, we are also seeing that the sorting and recycling companies, but also the uh, producing companies, uh, are now starting to build up these sorts of facilities and capacities in, in the Europe. So that's a, a good shift, I think. In, in this. Can I ask about regulations around this? So in the EU we have the EPR, which is Extended Produce Responsibility, which we have for packaging, also to packaging, paper, and cars, and electronics, which means that the producer should be responsible for what they put on the market. They should also be responsible for taking care of that in an environmentally friendly way, which would be recycling or reuse. And this has so far not been working greatly since it's been sent to China, but with that regulation in place, there's now a pressure on the producers that put things on the market that actually solve this situation. So I, I think that maybe this is sort of catalyzing this change in, in Europe. Was this an answer to your question? Uh, yeah, and I think just the other thing is, I think something, at least in the US, uh, as far as this is, yeah, and I can speak to experience here where I'm standing, I'm in an apartment complex and we have a recycling bin and I can go down there and it's probably, the people that recycle, it's about a small can every uh, week of people because I don't think they know what to recycle and how to and it's, it's a big order for a lot of people and I think there's something that has to be in this country at least that has this sort of cultural mindset sort of change in the way what to recycle and make it easier to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's also the case in, in, yeah. in Europe. So we might look good and sound good, but we also have these issues like people don't know, should I put this in the plastic recycling or is it, is it for incineration or where should I put the stuff? So we see that in, in, and we have been doing it for quite a long time. So it's also a learning curve and it's also about making it easy for people uh, and you know how should we do that and how should we inform people in the right way and, and stuff like that. So it's a work in progress I think all over the world but the more we realize that also I get a lot of questions if, if recycling is really happening or don't you burn it anyway and these kinds of issues. So there's also these kinds of myths to, to work against and, and to keep constantly inform people that this is actually happening. Uh, so yeah, you just have to do that sort of groundwork uh, and, and not stop. And we've been having these collections since '94 in Sweden, and we still do a lot of information, and we still need it. So yeah, that's just you just have to be patient, I guess. One of the challenges is what can be recycled is always changing. Yeah. So you know what yeah. can be accepted, what can't, and, and new things that come out, and yeah. can they be recycled or not? So it's like you constantly have to be educating people. 
And we also have a big problem here with wish cycling, right? So you know, people put stuff in there that they hope will be recycled, <laughs> but it just contaminates everything. And it's a, it's a cultural issue. That's a cultural issue. But the other issue is, yes, but the cycle is constantly changing. So how do we keep educating people that want about that? Now, I think DPW made a recycle act. I'm ashamed to say I don't use it. I don't know if anybody here uses it, but I think maybe apps can be part of the solution where I take a photo of something and maybe it'll tell me whether I can recycle it or where I can recycle it. I, I don't know. Yeah. So. Yeah, and also to maybe how much pressure should we put on the households or the private persons right. rather than what should the system solve. So I talk about this a lot in Sweden and, and is this a packaging, is this not packaging? Uh, we know that the black plastic is hard to recycle because it's hard to sort, but the uh, recycling facility or the sorting facility in Sweden, they encourage everyone so I try to bring the message, like, put everything that is packaging in the packaging container because that's for the system to take care of, not for you as a, as a client or a customer to take care of. So that's also that would be part great. of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were a couple of things that came up with this in, in Charlotte and Rotterdam as well. Um, you were sort of mentioning something that sounded a lot like pays you throw away, uh, which is the most successful policy to date in terms of diverting waste from landfill. But it does put more pressure on, on households. It's uh, charging for trash service uh, as a utility, uh, but not charging for recycling or compost. That very clearly signals to consumers where they should be putting materials and pay more attention to it. Um, you can also flip that stick into a carrot. Um, when there's more, uh, more and more apps out there, more and more uh, IoT devices out there, um, this is something we suggested in Charlotte, which was a uh, to a, a local coin, a Rotterdam has a Rotterdam coin uh, attached to this as well, uh, where you can earn credits that can be used at local businesses based off of your ability to sort. Now, that requires a, a implementation and rollout of technology that's up and coming, but that's another way to sort it. Um, uh, EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, takes many forms, uh, but we are working with several companies to, to push it back into product design. Mm, yeah. um, one of the things that came up recently in a project I'm working on is um, there might be a bunch of companies making the same sort of yogurt cup, um, but they all have different additives to the plastic based on their budgets and their branding and their designs, which makes recycling that a huge pain. Um, specifically for certain recycling technologies, it makes it impossible to sort that plastic down. Mm. So getting we, we can't really get to even a good recycled economy, let alone a circular economy, uh, if we don't get all the way back up to uh, product design. Um, so this is uh, industry engagement, this is consumer engagement, this is policy, this is uh, also consumer pressure. Um, and by the way, the businesses that are working with us on that are doing it because of consumer pressure. Um, so it does matter. Uh, the voice does matter. But anyway, uh, we used to get turn our pop bottles back in, or our soda bottles, our glass bottles, uh, and we would get a nickel back. Oh, that was a big to-do. Uh, and you could even save them up, but you washed them out, right? And you put them back in a little case, and you carted them off, might have a little wagon or whatever, and took them back, and people did it. You know, you, did, you would not throw them away a glass pop bottle or a soda bottle. You just wouldn't do it. That's money. Um, and so it just gets so fast. The other thing is our landlord put, um, I'm still living in an apartment building, and the land, well, the, yeah, the property management company uh, put up a, a thing on the wall uh, on, in the elevator to say these things can be, uh, what do you say, recycled. And they gave pictures, okay? But then when we started doing it, um, we kept saying, wait a minute, is that on that picture? Uh, like, the, like the yogurt cup, the yogurt cups, right? Uh, similarly, you know, it's like, well, and if we have to wash them out, okay, I don't have a problem with that. We can wash it out. But where is the cost savings from doing that? You know, where are we getting a break on it? It's like working for something. Okay, it's great to work for the whole, the good of the whole. But who's benefiting from this, really? Okay, and so I think it's going to have to be broken down to the cost of houses, uh, incentivizing, um, and who should do the incentivizing, and um, definitely to the popular education students. Thank you, Jean. Yes. Oh. yes. I'm a. Oh, I'm 
Rosemary, and I'm a gardener. I manage, uh, uh, it's my hobby. Um, yeah, good name goes with it. And um, what, I, what I always find disappointing in the conversation about um, food waste and composting is that composting is an art, and it's an important aspect of restoring the earth and the soil which reduces CO2 emissions, but um, just gathering food waste and putting it into a compost pile is not high quality. It's sort of like the recycling problem. It's not really a high quality reuse of materials. And I think we also need um, to be include that in the conversation of like, if you really want to have nutritional food, you have to have incredible compost, and incredible compost is a science mm -hmm. that is, you know, is, we should just put that on each consumer to do, so. There are composting facilities, yeah. right, that you can take stuff to, and hopefully are doing a good job at it. Yeah, but I mean, I think the average person has no idea how to really, any idea of what right. really goes in the compost. I agree. Why it's even as important. <laughs> All they think is it's preventing landfill. And that's a very small part of the conversation. <laughs> that's great. In, in a lot of places, you have the public services offering composting and pickup. I think, of course, you need other input sources, not just food waste, right? Yeah, and Philbert Street Garden um, had classes on how to compost. And that's how I learned about compost. But there's also tons of internet sites that are DIY, you know, do it yourself and how to make compost. And I know you're saying it's a science, but I haven't, I haven't had any problem with composting from day one. Okay. We have beautiful compost. And I, I just feel like it's, if we make it so difficult, then people aren't going to do it and move forward. I think we need to have maybe more classes and outreach and make it a really, like, if it is a difficult thing to make it simple so that they can understand it and do it in some way or fashion. We're doing it in our backyard and we're not having any problems at all. <laughs> I think I think you can compost without problem. Anybody can compost. It is simple. But if you really want to create soil that you can grow nourishing food in, that's that's a whole other thing that my experience when I go to these classes about composting, they don't include that. And there are, um, I mean, it's probably more important on the farm level where there's composting and you're having in, um, you know, huge agri-industry, and not the commercial agri-industry, but like, um, you know, even these organic farms, they're not necessarily composting correctly. And, um, and that creates its own environmental issue. Could you give an example of what's correct? What makes it good? Well, it has to come to a certain temperature. It has to have um, the healthy microbiomes in it to, um, and, you know, the healthy, um, no, no, probably the most important thing bringing it to a certain temperature where everything gets transformed, and then having the right ratio of carbon and uh, green material. Um, but you can, there are ways of measuring the um, nutritional value, and you're getting you know, the right pH for everything um, as well. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's, create, it's basically creating a Thank you. So I would like to ask everybody here in the room, because there's very different approaches. You can compost in your backyard, or you can have a bin for pickup and goes to an industrial composting, maybe an aerobic digester even, which is also very popular. Um, there you can even, if you wait long enough, you can even go through the uh, industrial degradable compostables, like the plates, the forks that you get now everywhere. 
that you can't do in your backyard. So who's for the backyard? Is there? I suggest, who? I suggest the third yes. one. Yes, the third one. Okay. A quarter, a four blocks. No, it's just four blocks composting. Four blocks composting. So community composting. Yeah. Community yeah. composting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm Nora. I work at the Loading Dock where we have all these lovely people today for a tour. We're a building materials reuse center in southeast Portland. About 40% of the waste in U.S. landfills is actually construction waste, which is pretty shocking. Um, and also in Baltimore, we have a massive reuse network and in the surrounding area too, D.C., um, Pennsylvania, really everywhere. Um, and I think we, there was a database, it's called Redo, um, and second, Station North Tool Library, they're doing a great job here in Baltimore. Um, but yeah, there's so many resources. You can drop off your compost, your household compost, at every farmer's market in Baltimore. Um, there's a station, I think it's specific days sometimes, but I know the Waverly Farmer's Market has that, um, the JFX Farmer's Market has that. So I would encourage everybody to basically Google your questions um, about how to do this stuff in Baltimore because it exists. Like, it, it really does. Um, and if you have any questions for me specifically, you can totally ask me. I want to see that zero waste plan, whoever has the info on that. Um, I have a copy of it here. Awesome. Um, one quick question. I, I think composting is, you know, we can debate any of these issues like all day, but it really is a Rubik's Cube. I like that analogy a lot. Um, specific question, because I think in Baltimore we have a lot of businesses and I think the public-private intersection is really cool and important and I would love to hear from um, either Dan, I know I'm saying your name in an Americanized way, sorry, and Matilda, um, about how you started those partnerships and how you talk about profit sharing. That's really interesting to me because I think that for-profit entities do have a massive responsibility that we're not asking them to fulfill. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my basic question. Great, great. Thank you, Nora. Um, it's not easy, first of all, to get partnerships with uh, existing manufacturers and existing uh, other companies. But what I found uh, has helped us is the fact that the, the Dutch government said we want to have a, a fully circular economy by, by 2050. Well, that's not an option. <laughs> I, I, so that, that helps me to sort of scare some manufacturers and say, Especially hey, this is... We don't have all the new sources, so... Um, but yeah, so that's... Um, yeah. <laughs> I hope I have an answer for you, but I think the, the, the there is... Um, you, you need all three pillars of society. You need, the pe you need the people, you need the companies, and you need the government to all come together and, and try and make a change. And if, yeah, you need, you really need each other. And um, I think the... But it could also be the government on a lower level. Right, so it yeah, could yeah, also yeah. be like, like you have Maryland here, you have the city yeah. here, so it could also be on a lower level. It doesn't yeah. have to be the government. Yeah. I think, I think what we sometimes forget about our current system, it's, we've only had this for about 200 years, and it's, it was, you know, it, the concept of, of how we tax things, how we produce things, all of this is not very old. It's something that we sort of perfected, uh, and we now think is normal. But there are, you know, many, many other ways to do things. And I like to, I like to think about the city of Amsterdam, where I live, uh, not so long ago, the, the canals that connect sort of all the you know, all the streets in Amsterdam were used as sewage and garbage dump, and that, that is how every, everything got, you know, uh, how we took care of things. And, and we, we completely changed that. And, and it, so it's possible, you know, it's, it's, we've done this before. We completely changed our sewage and, and waste systems. So I think we, we can do it again. The story that we had in our business was that it was uh, two guys 
uh, that I've heard about this idea how the insurance system work, works, and they were thinking, okay, this is not right, this is not really so sufficient, this is not the way it should be. So they started with like two hands or four hands and just they had they started just from scratch and they started to talk to the insurance companies in, in this case. And I think a very important thing to do when you try to change a business model or a process is that you need to add value. So they were saying, okay, you should do this and you will say this and this and this. So they didn't actually didn't talk about circular economy or sustainability or anything like that. But they started with the business case. And then uh, I met them and I said, oh wow, this is circular economy. We should, we should we package, it, package it like that. And we are working with large companies. And in Sweden, you have to um, write a sustainability report every year. And you have to show the numbers, how are you doing, how are you working with sustainability, and we have that data. So after 2016, we have been selling and providing sustainability work that actually can generate the data that they need. So yeah, it's a little bit like you, you, you we are actually, actually selling solutions that's based on a circular economy and sustainability work that the large companies in our area, you must work with. You must do that. There's like no option. Thank you. I'm, I'm sitting here listening. I moved to Gold today. I've been here about a month now. I, I moved here from the Caribbean. And right before I left, I was at, I actually uh, moderated a panel on regenerative festivals and, um, and, and circular economy, looking at how festivals create a lot of things and, and how to move forward with changing this. One thing that came up in the session, and again, we were talking about the global south, you understand? So there's a definite, definite inequity between the global north and the global south. But it seems to me like, when I'm sitting here listening, I don't hear much new. You know, to a certain extent, we have to really kind of glance back at the way we used to do things. Like when the milkman came and delivered bottles and you put the bottles out again in the morning. I was listening to you and my father could fix anything. I mean, we, <laughs> I was always embarrassed because we never had anything new in the house because he fixed it. So, but it really is kind of about, about and the thing is coming from this perspective of the global south, sometimes I worry about it. Because in the global south, one of the things that happen is we, a lot of times people go in and say you have to do it the new way. And then you come around and say, oh wait, your way was, your way was correct, now we have to go back. So I think that, you know, in phrasing it, when fixing things, not buy, not buying things new, companies should make a, a commitment to to building things that don't break so easily. They're part of the problem also. That's part of their business model. And I mean, to a certain extent, this is prior to the gentleman that you showed on the screen who was the devil, <laughs> who sold that idea of the linear economy. So we kind of just have to readopt what we kind of used to do. So. But I would like to add that we also should make that more attractive because now buying new stuff is so attractive. It's accessible everywhere, available, and you can order things uh, every every second, and they'll be delivered to you. And um, we should go back to um, a situation where repairing and, and sharing is just as easy and is easier actually than getting a new product. So seeing the value of things once more. That's important, I think. For me, and for a big part of this Pocasito project, uh, one of the reasons we love the circular economy and just going back to fixing things and sharing, yeah. and these examples that we've heard today from Europe, it is about going in and making it more attractive and, and celebrating these ideas. I think what the circular economy has, what these examples have, is that it creates a community. It brings people together. And that's something that the throwaway society cannot give us. It, it takes us away from society. It takes us away from other people. And that's what I think is so inspiring about some of these stories. 
and that's what I also think, and what I what I think about what Jane was sharing, is that it brings people together who have been left out of so much of the economic development, especially over the last 50 years, and it empowers them to create the communities and the societies that, that will lead to prosperity for more people and more inclusive society. That's what this project is about, and that's what I'm really happy to see expressed in, in these projects that are actually happening. Not just theories or ideas, but things that are happening today. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I think I fully agree with that. And I think it's, it's really also going, we don't have to come up with new technologies. You're totally right. I mean, the whole idea, I mean, if we look at nature, of course, if we just look at nature, there's no waste there. So we just have to look at how people used to do this. Used it's like to eating, like in the crib, we used to eat out of a calabash. Right. <laughs> it's so simple. It's, 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 it comes from the earth, you, you can clean it, yes. and it, it's, it, if, you, if it breaks, it's biodegradable. Yeah. And then you can exactly. get another calabash. Easy. Exactly. They're all over the place. I, I just had a funny thought. Um, because I don't know if you have it in Europe, but women talk about shopping therapy. You know, they get to go out and so we have to go. <laughs> yeah. So instead of promoting shopping therapy, we have to go back to the stitch and bitch. <laughs> or, you know, how instead of going out shopping for therapy, getting together with people and repairing for therapy, you know? We were actually with the same group, we were just in Phoenix, and we were visiting the Arizona State University campus in, in Tempe, actually, and they had a sign up on one of these little columns in the middle of the quad, or whatever they call it nowadays, and it said, swap till you drop, instead of shop till you drop. And it was uh, a group of uh, students getting together to trade things, instead of going out and shopping, buying new things, but discovering more about each other, too. I thought that was really kind of fun. Kind of speak to what you're saying. I just want to make a one more point um, in the context of what you're saying about community. And also, one thing I uh, appreciate your, uh, I don't know what you call your name? Jenny. Jenny, and also, just Jenny, 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 and then also the uh, presentations that are on the lawn. Uh, one, I'm a part of, I'm on the board of an organization out of Detroit called We Want Green Too. And I think that the, the, the name of the organization is very critical because it's something where they feel a lot of uh, lower income areas really feel left behind. And when we have these conversations like this, a lot of the conversations are very privileged in their, in their points of views. And so I think we have to be very careful about how we speak, but also how we include everyone in there because you know, going to classes or learning composting I think, sounds great if you're middle class and you have a home and you've got all the sort of privileged aspects to really make the middle class change. I think you really have to look at the lower income in a more serious way, and not just the side side note that oh, this is bad, this is where they're happening. But they need to really be a part of the conversation. So I do appreciate the context of what's happening here. But even like in Europe, the um, the immigrants that are coming into those cultures as well. They've got a lot of experience from you know, recycling themselves just for their own families. And so I really feel like that's something that has to be a part of that conversation. So I'd just like to emphasize that uh, we are privileged, but in general, um, I don't know what they want to say in general. And we have to really recognize that. And I think if we start from the lower income, sometimes we get a better outcome from everyone. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so actually to that point with the immigrants or refugees, uh, we were in Denver, that was like two years ago or something, and there's a group called Denver Urban Gardening, and they specifically engage refugees in urban gardening. Uh, for one, it's something where you don't have to have a common language, because and pe a lot of the people were growing things at home uh, before they had to flee. So it's actually also something that reminds them of their past normal life before everything fell apart. And also it empowers them because they can grow something and they can then eat it and they can share, they can share knowledge, how to grow things, uh, but they can also share then the produce. And it's, it's really amazing uh, how this can be done in the middle of a city in an urban garden. And we were really uh, thrilled by seeing this. And this is also happening in, in Germany. We've seen that there, too. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, I just wanted to add the tag on to what Max was saying. What some of these these new immigrants to America were able to do in Denver was also grow some produce that they couldn't find at the local grocery store. So they could then recreate the meals for their children that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to share with them. So there's so much about making this new community their community that was enabled by including them and, and ensuring that they felt comfortable as part of this gardening community. And that, so I, I really appreciate what you said, and that is something that needs to be at the very front. Jane says this so beautifully, you know, you can't have hate and sustainability together. And I would also argue you can't have, you know, you have to be inclusive to be sustainable because otherwise you're, you're automatically putting a barrier in your place where you will trip up every single time. So unless we deal with those issues, unless we put them front and center in the development, uh, of these sustainability policies, then they're never going to actually be successful for our communities. Yeah, I had two thoughts I'd like to share. The first one is uh, talk about the compost. It's a great idea for everyone to learn how to do that. But the key fact that uh, I didn't hear you guys talk about was when you use compost in gardening, you're getting what we call the macronutrients. But the, the key critical element for um, sustainability is the micronutrients, and that's the calcium, the magnesium, the iron, and that goes with the soil base. So, I mean, composting is great, but we also have to remember that's just touching the surface that just gives us growth, but it doesn't give us what's most important, the nutritional value of the foods. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is everyone had great input, but, and we keep talking about circular society, circular economy, and it sounds good, but you know, when I listen to everyone speak, the, the word that comes to mind is a circular web. And, and, and the thing that would put everyone, or sort of what I call the glue, would be like a circular infrastructure, because there's a lot of valid points, a lot of good ideas, but how does it all come together, and how does everyone work together? So that's just context. Thank you. Andrew has something to say about yeah, that's actually a great segue into something that I've been thinking about in terms of um, inclusive inclusivity and bringing everyone along. And, um, you know, you can have the best intentions with a policy uh, or with a strategy, but when it comes down to people's real lives, uh, there's different forces acting upon them. Uh, there's a framework that uh, I use all the time that sort of like unlocked a couple of these barriers for me, which is called the four levels of thinking. Uh, basically saying that something like the amount of waste that gets composted uh, or uh, air pollution in neighborhoods or certain regions of the country is uh, an event, so that's the highest level thing, and you can change that by uh, shutting down an incinerator, boom, that's immediately one thing done, but there's still a bunch of other incinerators around the country, uh, and maybe actually you're creating a different problem. Uh, those events are caused by people acting in certain patterns of behavior, but people act that way because certain structures uh, are supporting them, and this is to your point about infrastructure. That could be physical infrastructure, that could be social infrastructure, that could be cultural infrastructure, that could be uh, legal or financial infrastructure that causes people to act in a certain way because they get rewarded for acting that way or punished for acting another way, or it's just not convenient enough. Um, and underneath that is the hardest thing to change, but the most impactful, which is our mental model of how the world should work. Um, and bring it up because a lot of the sort of consumer responsibility stuff that gets pushed as a solution uh, ignores one very basic fact about even the wealthiest societies today uh, is that we have created an economy in which everyone is time poor and everyone is isolated. Uh, so if you want to tackle something like waste to landfill, uh, you are looking at all these different parts of the Rubik's Cube, all the way up to uh, working hours and salaries and minimum wage and building codes and waste management plans um, and it's really helpful to get at least a common understanding uh, of what you're aiming for. You've got to pull, you've got to pull planning in on this, you've got to pull community organizations in on this, you've got to pull public private partnerships in on this, um, otherwise you just, you can only get a little bit of the wedge. We need exponential change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and one last statement here. <laughs> Sorry, this is not very profound to end it. I just had a, a question, actually. You had mentioned, um, obviously, we would all agree that in the United States we have very um, hostile 
um, federal policies when it comes for the most part when it comes to the environment. Um, and you had mentioned change that can happen um, on the local government level. So I just was wondering if anybody could speak to that and things that are already happening in Baltimore and Maryland in our local area, and also things that we can work sort of more specifically towards um, in our own in our own vicinities. <coughs> That's an open question, not only to the Europeans, but to everybody in the room. Anybody who has the answers. Okay. Mike. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of local answers um, in this area. Um, of course, I mentioned the Baltimore Clean Air Act earlier as one. Um, there are also many resolutions that led to that. Um, zero waste resolutions, um, other related climate resolutions, um, clean air resolutions and some of them are leading to some of our next steps, so bringing actual zero waste policies, bills, to city council to do things like mandate deconstruction of buildings instead of tearing them down and creating the construction demolition waste. Um, in D.C. I helped um, amend and improve a law that was passed in 2014, actually two laws, um, one of which um, banned styrofoam, um, also required all food serviceware to be compostable or recyclable. Um, including banning straws, plastic straws, although they didn't enforce that until more recently. <laughs> they thought there was some loophole, and there wasn't. Um, so there are a lot of pieces of the solution. Um, some are still struggling over. For example, they in DC send their electronic waste to a company that uses prison labor, which is typical for electronic waste recycling. Um, it's also typical for that to get dumped on, on developing nations and people are in very terrible conditions sifting through that stuff. And so we try to get standards in there that prevent against that, and we actually got them in, but the electronics industry got in and took all our standards out before it was passed. Um, so there are continuing battles on, on things like that, but there's a whole menu of solutions on every kind of waste you can think of, happy to talk about details, whether it's pharmaceutical waste, medical waste, et cetera, there are alternatives for all this stuff. And then enforcement. That's also awesome. big that's a big part of that, right? Okay, great, great. And I think um, we're almost at the end of the evening, Brendan, do you want to have some closing thoughts? Well, one thing that I want to say, I think somebody mentioned it earlier, you can take a bag, and you can take a bag for a friend, and a friend of a friend, uh, because we want people to just get in the habit, and to have it easy, to have it convenient, for people to start thinking of ways that, that they can live a more circular lifestyle in any aspect of life. It doesn't have to be the perfect answer. It doesn't have to be the, the total solution, but it, as long as people start to think about these things and it gets reinforced by the people around them. I mean, one of the things that I love about events like this is that we were in Atlanta last year. I think there were five people in the room. And somebody said, what's the point of this? And we're all just, and I said, it's, it might just be performative, but there's still something very powerful that people choose to come together to talk about this. Not only on the community building side, the community building side of it, but on the environmental side, on the let's save our planet side, on the let's change this society side. And those things, no matter how few there are, I still think that's a beautiful thing and it does give a lot of hope. Um, the other thing that I would say is there are resources out there. There are people who are doing things. They might not be the world's best expert at everything, but they're trying. And, and work with them. And, and, and find out ways that you can maybe create a, a stitch and talk. <laughs> stitch and complain about the way things are. Uh, but there are very easy ways to get together with neighbors and friends and create new uh, environments for people to feel comfortable trying new things. Uh, it's very simple for us, you know, even just having vegan food. I don't know if anybody hated the food up here, but I found it quite good. Nobody complained to me about it. So there are, and, and all of the, the plates and the cutlery, it's not simple, but the more people do it, the more they get used to it. And the more they get used to it, the more likely it's going to be just the way they live. And, and that's how change starts to build. But there's one thing I wanted to say. Um, tonight is actually the end of the Pocasito project. This has been a four-year project that Max and I have undertaken. We visited 14 different cities across the United States. We were in Detroit. Uh, that was one of our first cities. Um, 
And it's been really amazing and powerful to see these communities all across America where people are really engaged on this topic. People with a wealth of information, they want to share it. Uh, one of the most um, rewarding aspects has been bringing people from Europe to talk to a group and maybe the best connection that happened is two people from the same city who had no idea they were passionate about the same things and working toward the same goals. And that's something that we continue to see. And uh, so Max, I want to say thank you because the last four years have been a lot of fun. We've done a lot of traveling. I'm ready to go home. Um, and we'll write a book and hopefully that will be available to everybody so you can see the results and the synopsis of everything we've done. But it's been a real privilege to travel across the United States, meet lots of people, and to feel good, especially in this day and age, to feel really good about the people in the United States. And I, even Martine was saying that she interacts with people throughout this country who really have their hearts in the right place, who are really doing the right things. And those people are there. So hopefully we can continue to find funding and, and find venues and find places to go and people to talk to so that we can prove and, and continue to make this the reality that the world sees of the United States and also to make this the reality for the next generation. Well, thank you so much and I can only uh, say thank you, Brendan, for doing this together. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. I mean, this is really the core of Pocasito is just the people in Pocasito and uh, it's not really you know, it's not a club, it's not a, you know, there's no memberships, it's just people meeting people and connecting with people. I also want to say, of course, yes, we're not from here, so we're not going to be here every week, unfortunately. Uh, we hope to be back here, but there is also, there's an online community, but I also hope that everybody who's from here, actually, that you keep meeting, like what you kind of hinted at, that this is kind of a starting, a, step for a process, two different people from different backgrounds getting together, not always all agreeing on everything, of course not, there's so many things to discuss, so many viewpoints, and it is very often not like the answer, there's different perspectives, different uh, priorities, and so it's very important to keep working on this together. Uh, very often, and we find this very often, with ourselves, but also we see it with others. When something gets tough, or there's different views, people turn around and leave. And I think that's one of the most difficult things in our times, because it's just like the fixing, the repair cafe, but we need that also for our relations, for our communities, because no, we can't all agree on everything all the time but we should not stop talking to each other because of that. So important that we go to the repair cafe and we keep having that community. And it's just like in a family. In families, people have severe disagreements, but you're still family. And it's the same thing in a community. And if, as long as we have this kind of guiding idea where we want to go, just the direction, not the exact number or milestones, that will be good enough to keep us going and meeting again. So thank you all. I think we can close and there is more food and drink and we can mingle and talk to each other here in the room. I want to say thank you all very much. Thank you to our speakers. It was a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night.